few weeks, there's like something else they didn't realize that you had to do, you know, so. And one of them was give a technical talk here at the end. It was like, <laughs> oh, crap, I better come. So I thought it'd be fun to go revisit uh, my uh, uh, thesis area, uh, which is, uh, I looked at the uh, the groundwater system that feeds the Blue Springs of the in the Little Colorado Gorge in Grand Canyon, Arizona. So, I mean, but um, the uh, uh, objectives of my study was to uh, look at the factors responsible, the locations and quality of the spring, identify the sources of uh, water, describe the, the flow paths um, that that bring water to the uh, to the springs. Um, I, was al I also looked at uh, the, fa the um, factors responsible for collapsed breccia pipes in the vicinity of Little Colorado. The place is full of these collapsed breccia pipes, which are I'm not going to talk about today, but uh, much of these, uh, they, they bottom in the Redwall limestone and the Paleo karst, and they extend 3,500 feet to the section. And at the surface, there some of these are like half a mile in diameter. Um, and then, uh, uh, so, but we're going to focus on groundwater. So the Black Mesa Hydrologic Basin, this is sort of its general outline. It covers much of northeast Arizona and into uh, western uh, um, uh, New Mexico. Yeah, you can see uh, Flagstaff, Sedona. Um, this is the Grand Canyon. Here's Four Corners up here. And this is uh, kind of the area that I looked at uh, more closely. Um, one of the things that I'm going to do today, a little dis disclosure. Uh, um, I'm not. I didn't make an attempt to bring up be up to date on all the latest research that's been done here. Uh, if you're interested in the latest, uh, the, uh, the best geologic mapping, you should look at George uh, Billingsley's work and the groundwater and geochemistry, Lori Crossy and Carl Karlstrom, the USGS, um, oh, I forget the fellow's name, is continued to do work down there. Um, but uh, what I, there wasn't, when I started my work down there, there wasn't a good geologic map. So I had to create a, a, a geologic map we identified and mapped springs, analyzed the water quality samples. I actually did all the analyses myself, um, compiled uh, a bunch of regional uh, data, and created some uh, uh, structure contour maps and such, and then uh, looked at the, the breccia pipes. So here's a map of Arizona, and here's the uh, sort of the larger area that I looked at from a regional standpoint. And then this is the detailed study area here, and there's uh, this is the confluence here of the, of the Little Colorado and the Colorado, and there's Blue Spring, uh, Flagstaff uh, down here, and the San Francisco Peaks are in this area. So this is a Google image, and uh, once again, there's the confluence. Here's the Little Colorado Gorge coming through like this. This is Highway 89, town of Cameron, Gray Mountain, Desert View Tower, Grand Canyon here. The North Rim would be over. Uh, in this area, it's kind of photo is a little bit dark, but this is a stratigraphic section. Here, uh, this is the rim. This is the, looking at the confluence. You can't quite see it, but this is blue water coming into the green of the Colorado right here. This is looking north, and this section goes extends from the the Tapete sandstone, uh, Cambrian, which is approximately equivalent to the uh, Tintic um, uh, that we have here in Utah. Um, the Bright Angel Shale, the Muav and Cambrian section, then this, this massive cliff here is the Red Wall, Mississippi and limestone, equivalent to the Great Blue or the Madison, roughly. And then the uh, on top of that, the uh, the Supai group. This is uh, uh, and uh, Esplanade Sandstone, Hermit Shale, the uh, Coconino Sandstone, massive, uh, Toro Weep, and at the very top here is the Kaibab limestone, which is a resistant layer, which forms the marble platform, and um, uh, so um, so here's the uh, detailed geologic map of that area. Uh, the confluence is just off the map here. Uh, Cameron is just off the map here to the east, and you can see the uh, the, the gorge getting deeper and deeper. Um, uh, the uh, lot of normal faults, many many normal faults. These are the all these lines that you see. Um, uh, 
It's also, we're at the um, sort of the eastern end of the East Kaibab monocline, and it breaks into different segments here. Um, this is the Grandview section <laughs> here, and this is, uh, I forget the name of this one, it's on another figure. There's also some minor folds, the uh, Blue Spring monocline, which is um, out here uh, to the northeast of the, uh, of the Kaibab. Um, and you can see these grobbins. And then all these little dots are those uh, collapsed breccia pipes. So here's an aerial view um, uh, looking, the gorge is here. So this is looking to the south, southeast. And this is the East Kaibab monocline. This is the water little hill segment. Um, and this is the Grandview segment. And then uh, Gray Mountain is just a little bit to the east here. Uh, the highway, uh, if you've gone to the south rim from Cameron, runs along uh, this up through here. Um, let's see. And then here are those grobbins. This is looking uh, to the southeast again. Here's the gorge here. Uh, you can see uh, um, down drop blocks here. Um, uh, 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 many, many uh, normal faults. Um, Here's one of those faults. Um, uh, you can see down on the left side here. Um, uh, this is the uh, uh, this is Coconino, and this is the uh, the the red wall exposed down here, uh, down on the on the left side. Uh, here's a another one of those faults. You can see down in the canyon, uh, 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 down on uh, on the right side here. Um, uh, this is down in the, still in the red wall. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about breccia pipes, but I thought I'd show a couple photos. There's some great exposures of them in the walls of the Little Colorado. Here's one that appears to be, this is uh, the, the, the rim here, and um, uh, this is Kaibab and Torweep down here. And this one appears that it, it may bottom out in the, uh, in the Kaibab. Who knows? You can see the... Uh, in a collapsed breccia pipe, everything is moved downward. There, there are solution features that form groundwater circulating through, and, and then they continue to collapse, and, and uh, circulating groundwater removes the material, and, and they continue to they stope upward. Here's another. This is a, uh, another one nearby, and this one extends all the way down into the, into the Coconino here. You can see the breccia here, and, and uh, um, this... Uh, uh, here in this uh, great exposure, this uh, collapsed breccia pipe that didn't quite, none of the beds here uh, are deformed at the surface, so this one didn't quite grow that, that high. Um, <coughs> so on to the uh, groundwater, I, I uh, mapped and sampled uh, 59 uh, individual springs um, in the canyon, uh, and that area I just showed you is in this uh, area here. One thing to, to, to know is that Little Colorado is only perennial in its lower uh, 13 miles. Um, and beginning with, uh, with Blue Spring, it's perennial from here down, but above it, if you see water in it, it's only, it only flows in the springtime during, uh, or sometimes in winter, during the, the, the spring runoff, and then um, during summer thunderstorms. Uh, but um, the very first spring, though, is right here at uh, Paiute Trail uh, Spring. It's about 20 gallons per minute. And then the Blue Spring is almost 100,000 cubic feet per second. And the total flow uh, at about this point is about uh, a little over 200 uh, uh, cubic feet per second. So we're going to focus on those springs in that area. Uh, one of the things we did was, um, uh, with a pygmy meter, went down and, and measured the flow at oh, a dozen or so locations. And you can see the increase in flow as, as you move downward. The total flow at the mouth is about a little over 220 cubic feet per second. But it, uh, once we got over 200 CFS, it got really hard to, to make, actually make the measurements out there you know, um, uh, using uh, standard pygmy meter methods. But you can see zero CFS here, um, 99, 168, 200. Let's see. Uh, and most of the water comes out of the Redwall limestone. Um, uh, 
173 uh, cubic feet per second. Uh, here you can see it better on this strat column. The, the Esplanade sandstone is where that first sand spring is. About um, uh, maybe the total flow is maybe 200 gallons a minute, but it seeps back into the uh, into the uh, uh, alluvial deposits on the. You see the springs appear and then they seep in, in back into the alluvial deposits, um, and uh, quite a bit of flow from the the Cambrian and, and the Muab, Muab, and then uh, some spring flow from the uh, Tapete sandstone. So, my first thought was, was down here, we're a long ways from any recharge area, at least 10 miles as the crow flies, not counting in, you know, circuitous groundwater flow paths. So I thought, well, the, the temperatures so far away should all be about the same. And they weren't, you know, like they range, the, the range isn't big, 69 to 72 degrees, and then uh, down here they get to be 76, and this particular spring has 80 degrees F. And I kept going, kept thinking, well, they should be the same. So I would go back and remeasure the temperatures and try to get in as close to the discharge point as possible. But this is, um, so was, I thought that was unusual. That for why would we have this temperature difference? And then uh, well, before I show you, so collected samples and analyzed just for major ions. It's kind of a fuzzy diagram. But uh, those of you that aren't familiar with stiff diagrams. Um, it's a way of, of graphically showing water quality, um, and uh, uh, where you, you plot uh, concentrations in milliequivalents per liter, like in these three lines. And this up, this top line, the way I have it is sodium and chloride in milliequivalents per liter, and then calcium and uh, bicarbonate and magnesium and sulfate. So, so here, these they look like flying saucers. So here is the uh, water quality of these springs. Once again, I thought, you know, so far from the source, the recharge area, the water quality ought to be pretty uh, similar. And it wasn't. Um, uh, you can see from the different shapes of these uh, stiff diagrams that there's quite a bit of, uh, there is variability um, in the composition of, water, of the water. And then uh, Blue Spring actually had the lowest TDS of about 20, almost 2,300 milligrams per liter, and then uh, many of the springs were close to 4,000, and then we had one spring that's uh, 23,000 um, cubic feet per second. On this diagram, I, I show these, uh, these normal faults, which tend, tend through um, the area. Uh, one interesting thing I didn't mention earlier is that um, you can see that the river, the gorge meanders back and forth, and that's where we pick, you know, cross back and forth across these faults, and then you see a lot of springs. Then there's this long straight section. We don't, where it, it uh, encounters a couple faults, but not many, and there are no, essentially, no springs and, and no increase in flow in this one straight section. Then, when the the river cuts back to the west, we pick up a whole bunch of more springs again. Um, another thing noticed uh, is that. The springs were near faults, but none of them were on on the faults. None of the springs were on the faults. They were nearby, but not you know none in the, in the fault zone themselves. Um, so, so we have this range in composition, and one way to look at that, the simple way, is the classic Piper diagram, which is a ternary diagram with you plot the uh, percentages of the cations in in this uh, left uh, triangle, and then anions here on the right, and then you you um, is a composite field here. And when you do that, uh, sure enough, you get this range in compositions. Uh, this uh, from Blue Spring at one end, sort of one end member, and then at the right here, um, we have the other end member. And uh, uh, so this is for the, the cations. And then the same thing with the anions. Um, this sort of, uh, um, and then and the composite plot at the top, uh, the same sort of pattern. And uh, uh, the Piper has a method where you can just sort of calculate the, uh, the mixing if you take those two end members. And so if you do that and uh, uh, you take uh, this spring 39, it, it was one end member and blue spring is the other. And then 
These other springs, these are just percentages. Like this spring is 73% uh, blue spring water, and then 27% uh, this other spring 39 water, and you can see this uh, uh, sort of mixing of the two different uh, waters. So I wanted to see how it related regionally, so I went and compiled water quality data from other wells in that 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 area that I that I showed that goes extends all the way down to Flagstaff, and and this is what you get. And these are the springs. This is where they fall, and uh, uh, um, so um, uh, this is up in the San Francisco as you go closer to Flagstaff, and then uh, these other waters are out in the uh, sort of the Black Mesa hydrologic basin, um, farther east. And uh, so if you look at, I use this as one end member, uh, this, uh, this well here, and this other well is another end member. And you can see you can, um, th the springs, uh, Blue Spring is about 86% of water of this, from this well and 14% of this well. And uh, so you have these, as it turns out, um, uh, um, the um, uh, if you if you just use this simple piper analysis, about 75 percent of the water discharging down here comes from the San Francisco Peaks area, and 75 uh, percent and 25 percent is water that's moved through the uh, um, Black Mesa hydrologic basin. This water is higher in calcium bicarbonate. This water is higher in sodium and chloride, and uh, and also sulfate, and uh, and they they this water flows northward and converges on these faults and comes out at these springs here, so it makes sense that you know if, if any of you have been down the flag in the, the San Francisco peaks, there are no perennial streams that come out of these mountains. All the water goes in the ground. Uh, you know they do have flooding time time to time when you know certain conditions happen, but generally there's no there's no perennial creeks that come out, it all goes in the ground and then all flows up here, well, much of it, and comes out at the, uh, at the Blue Spring. So, so he just, so generally, um, some findings, uh, total flow at the, at the confluence is about just under 230 cubic feet per second. That's, that's 164,000 acre feet per year. That, this, uh, 226 CFS, that's, uh, it's about 100,000 gallons a minute. And, uh, you know, the springs are located near, but not on the faults. Most of the water is coming from the, the red wall. There's a wide range of temperatures. Um, uh, this is the range of uh, TDS. And um, uh, we drank that water, by the way. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually got to like it after a while. You know, when you're down in the desert, and sort of, sort of beat. <laughs> Hauling water in, um, since we're hauling so much out, and about 75%, uh, you know, from the San Francisco peaks, and 25% from the Black Mesa hydrologic basin. So now we're going to go on to the scenic part of this, um, of my presentation. And uh, uh, once again, here's a, a Google Earth image of this area, and uh, I'm going to take you on a tour on a hike basically from the bridge at Cameron all the way down to the confluence. This is a hike of about 56 miles. If, and um, these photos, there's Desert View Tower about here, um, Salt Trail Canyon, that was one of our main uh, entries, uh, exits out of the, the canyon. Um, these photos come from you know several years of work and there are a lot of different uh, photographers, not all mine, but um, it's uh, generally going to go from one into the other. Oh, uh, this is actually off the map that I showed you. This is upstream. Started, this is uh, Grand Vault, Grand Falls. Anybody, anybody been to Grand Falls? It's if, yeah, it's really neat. If you were down there, it's the uh, this quaternary volcanics came in and uh, dammed the river and they had to come around a different way. Um, uh, Mark Eccles gave me this really neat engraving of a uh, drawing that was done of that a uh, um, long time ago. And it's fun to be there when it's when it's flooding. So this is not when you want to hike, when, when there's water <laughs> at Cameron. 
And actually, I know two guys that kayaked it illegally in 1976, and then they got arrested by uh, John Thomas, who was CEO of SWCA. Anybody know John? Uh, and um, and he's, uh, John's also in that book, uh, uh, Emerald Mile. He's in there, too. But he arrested these guys. Um, it had never been done before, as far as anybody knew. But So this is when you want to do it, when you want to hike. It's, uh, when it's, this is more typically when it's dry. And you can see we're, we're in the Kaibab here, just this, this is not very far below Cameron. Um, and this is still not very far below Cameron. And here, but we're um, all the way through the Kaibab and, and the Torweep. I think we're into the Coconino here. And there's a little wooden bridge right there. The, um, the Bureau wanted to build a, a dam here in the 20s, I think. And then in the 50s, there was a proposal to set off a nuclear device here and let the, the spring runoff go in and, and, and be stored in an uh, early version of uh, ASR, I guess. Uh, well, fortunately, they didn't do that. But this is uh, very narrow in here. And if you can see, there's actually it was flowing at this particular day. Um, and there's actually a ladder down in there. Um, uh, and this was probably not a good idea <laughs> to go down this ladder. I don't know if it's still. This was like 1980. And uh, that's uh, Todd Jarvis. If anybody knows Todd, uh, uh, um, he sent me an email from China. He's at some conference over there. And there's a, there's a natural uh, bridge right here. Um, so this is uh, about where that bridge is, maybe a little bit below. And you can see the walls are starting to rise. Uh, it's getting deeper, the, this beautiful Coconino uh, sandstone. Um, and it's dry. This, this particular hike we did in May, and it was a year that it hadn't flooded. It was a drought year. So the previous winter, it, it had not flooded down here. So uh, there was, uh, we heard stories of quicksand and all kinds of difficulties. And we had some of that, but not, not too bad. Um, let's see, uh, here we go. It's getting, you know, still deeper. And you can see this big uh, sort of boulder field here. And uh, see um, there's certainly some rock fall hazard. Um, I'm glad I wasn't there when that came down. And then these boulder fields, they're actually a lot of work to get through. I mean, the whole canyon is jammed up. I don't know how those guys kayak this. It was, uh, um, it must have been pretty, uh, pretty scary. Um, and uh, and it, took, it takes a while to get through this, this boulder field. This is from a trip I took down, uh, down there in, at Thanksgiving. And you can see like the beginnings of a, there was a snowstorm and and this, there's, uh, this is the beginning of a, of a flood coming through the canyon here. It, it progressed to about here. And you could hear kind of the roaring from the, from the rim where I was. Um, uh, this is the view from the top. This is sort of from Gray Mountain looking uh, to, the, to the north, northwest. And you can see the when you drive up to it, sometimes you just don't even see it. Then you, you get to it, and it's just this amazing chasm. Uh, this is from our first trip in. Um, uh, this was this is Paiute Trail, and uh, we hiked in here. This was at Thanksgiving. You see, it's, it was flooding at the time. It's our very first trip in, and this was a really dangerous hike in. <laughs> Later, we discovered there was actually a trail off to the side, but we went. There's a this is, there's a fault that comes through here, and um, uh, it was probably not a good idea to hike in like that. So here we are. Um, and this was at Thanksgiving also, and it's, uh, this was kind of a minor flood, but it was flowing. The river was flowing, and you know we're still above the red wall limestone here. Uh, getting close to the top of the red wall, uh, the rim's quite a ways up. Um, uh, just uh, hiking along, um, and here we are, finally down in the red wall, where we first start to see some springs. Um, uh, see water rising up. At some places, you can there's actually you can actually see the spring. It's close to the uh, to the level of the water, and much of the water is coming in as sort of underflow. Now here's a um, uh, example of a sort of a sand. This is a spring. You can see the sand boiling up here. Um, there's uh, 
these old caverns and paleo karst in the red wall. This one was discharging a teeny bit of water. Um, here we are, still above uh, Blue Spring, but um, but we're in the red wall, and there's there's uh, there's continual flow here now. Um, and then uh, you start to see this is travertine uh, being uh, deposited in the rocks here. Um, uh, Lovely, and then here it is. Here's Blue Spring itself, and uh, 97 uh, cubic feet per second. Um, see, it comes out of the ground clear with a bluish tint, uh, and uh, this this is probably six feet here, distance right there. And then this was uh, at, in, during a flood on Thanksgiving. I was over there collecting a sample, and you can see the. Um, Spring flowing in, and the, the it's really hard to hike <laughs> in there when it's uh, flooding because you can't see the rocks. And uh, so this is looking at Blue Spring from the rim. Uh, here's uh, Blue Spring is right here. So we were just looking in this beach back over here. There's faults that come through here, um, and there's a trail here called the Blue Spring Trail um, that you can take down to the springs. Are and this is. Uh, well, this is looking um, down the other way from Blue Spring. This is looking down river. Blue Spring would be under uh, here to the right. And then um, there's a number of very large springs that all discharge along here. You can see this meander here where it cuts back. And there's a little white spot here, and that's, uh, uh, that's probably not a good idea either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So your measuring section is right there. Uh, oh well. But um, you can see these beautiful solution joints. It's really interesting seeing in three dimensions this groundwater flow system discharging here. And this is a solution widened joint. Um, um, oh, there's probably 20 CFS coming out of these beautiful solution joints here. And you, could, you couldn't, like, you try to dr dive down probably eight or nine feet deep there at least, and you couldn't get down to where the water was just rushing out. Um, uh, and uh, just to illustrate, was, uh, this was at that Thanksgiving trip, which was, you couldn't see the bullets, you, you know, uh, constantly banging your shins and things in the water. It was uh, 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 kind of chilly. Um, so uh, it's easier hiking when it's, you know, not flooding. Um, so this is looking at that down that straight section where there aren't any springs from above. You can see the blue water down here, and this is Salt Trail Canyon, which is one of our major uh, the one we use the most to get in and out of the canyon. Um, so you know the water comes out with a bluish clear with a bluish tint, and then about three miles downstream it turns this incredible turquoise color and. Uh, uh, there's this white white calcareous ooze, um, and then you can see this. This is a these traver the travertine deposits, um, uh, and here's more rimstone pools and waterfalls. And you can see these right right here. This is actually another older remnant of a dam here, and uh, I tried to find it, um, uh, but I couldn't. I, when I was somewhere at home, I have. Uh, I found this article from 1910, National Geographic. The Cole brothers um, published their famous book about floating the Grand Canyon and then had their studio on Grand Canyon. They published um, some photos of the little Colorado uh, from about the early teens, and, and they show these huge, these massive, continuous um, travertine uh, dams that are gone now. and. Uh, um, I don't. I don't know if anybody's ever investigated it, but the uh, uh, there was a flood in the 20s, uh, way up on the Mugion Rim. A major, a uh, 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 big reservoir failed and and flooded down through here. And in fact, what was that USGS expedition in the 20s? I forget um, the guy's name. But anyway, the river came up like 35 feet on them. They were down below here and. Uh, I wonder whether that that uh, that flood is what tore out all those huge dams that used to be there. Um, great swimming holes 
really. Um, uh, here's some, see the travertine here, and, and uh, um, uh, you know this year it hadn't flooded, and you can see all this algae along the or the side, and that's where the you know the travertine uh, builds up. Um, there it is, you know at uh, Huntoon. Some people are only named, you know, think of them as like one word. That's my thesis advisor. <laughs> He's one of those, you know. Uh, He's a character, but um, uh, uh, a lot to him. Just really beautiful vistas. Here you can see the blue water and the the um, the red wall. Uh, I think we're down near the top of the Temple Butte uh, limestone. Uh, some of the side canyons have these uh, you know, lovely uh, travertine aprons. Um, this is Salt Trail Canyon. This was our, our main access in. It was about three miles or so, and you can see the blue water down here. Um, uh, hiking, and this is down near the, the head of, or the, the bottom of, we're still quite a ways above the river. The actual route in is back a ways, uh, but you come out here to the uh, top of the red wall and look down. This is looking up the river. Um, I think that's, this is that spring 39 where it's flowing in, that other end member, uh, in the, mixing with the blue water here. Um, uh, uh, Temple Butte and Muav, I believe. Um, this is just right the canyon, side canyon, uh, right below Salt Trail. Um, sometimes <laughs> swimming over to collect a water sample. Uh, this is the Sipapu. Um, you see water used to flow down the top and down the side, and then there was a flood. Uh, uh, my friend George Billingsley, when he was down here in the 60s, it was flowing out the top, but a uh, flood cut out the bottom, and it leaks out the side. But you can see the, the, the water, and that's that, w that spring that has the 23,000 uh, I mean, uh, TDS water, um, probably comes up from the, the Tafit Sandstone. This is in the Bright Angel Shale here. Um, and then here we are uh, at the confluence, um, looking from above. And uh, this is Chuar Butte here, where those two airliners collided in the 50s. And I, I spent the month of November here, in 1983, working, when I was working for the USGS, and we had a cableway right here. So. Uh, thanks to a lot of a lot of folks here, um, uh, um, Huntoon uh, Billingsley, who's just retired from the Geological Survey, Jarvis, Don Bills with the USGS, my brother uh, Paul Paschke, his uh, um, his wife is um, with the USGS in Denver. Um, some of you guys may know uh, Suzanne. And then, uh, so any questions? This is this is near um, Grandview, uh, I mean uh, Grand Falls. We're out there. So, any questions? <laughs> yes, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. They are uh, pretty rugged, though. Um, and they've they've closed a lot of the areas that we went into. They're closed now. You can't get it. To, yeah, yeah. Yes, Steve. Yes, it's just a calcium carbonate, and the, and where that turns that color, it it moves up and down the river depending upon the atmospheric conditions. Where it just goes. Uh, it's the water is super saturated with calcium carbonate, and it's all precipitating out. There are people studying the the um, uh, the travertine, and you know they've been age dating it and such. And the, the travertine here is a lot younger than like there's a lot of travertine on the on the uh, uh, I guess it's the left bank as you're going down the river on the east bank where they believe that the 
this groundwater system used to discharge uh, up farther up in the Marble Canyon, and then, and that travertine is older than the travertine down on the Little Colorado. Yeah. Um, it could be. George? I was going to ask about, is this all in tidal lands? Most of it is, yeah. It was funded by the Natural History, uh, Grand Canyon Natural History Association, but, and then we gave copies of pieces to all the tribes and such. Yeah? Yeah, they stopped there on their way, and Salt Trail Canyon was on their way to um, the, the, the Hopi salt mines, which are off limits in the Grand Canyon. And there is a great uh, account of a, of, a, of a salt expedition in the teens, like um, in a book called Sun Chief, um, where they left the Hopi mesas and walked across the Painted Desert and then down and then out to the... Uh, Visited the Sipapu and then back out. It's published in the 30s, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think so, I think it is, and it has much lower TDS than the water in Little Colorado. And you know, similar blue uh, travertine and stuff. So Ken. Yeah, there. That's where the yeah uranium, and that's I think it was during the Obama administration they they had a moratorium on mining those, and so the Orphan Pipe, which is actually in the park, was mined, and um, uh, that's a whole other story. I try to relate sort of the history of the erosion of the canyon to like earlier. Um, History of groundwater circulation, and but yeah, they are mineralized. That Lucy, no, it's buried. It's um, yeah, way deep. It's the uh, up there. You have the uh, you know the, the volcanics probably overlying uh, um, the uh, um, the Mokopi and Chinle and such and. And probably Kaibab, and it's buried. It's deeply buried there. I don't know if it's exposed. I forget whether it's exposed in the uh, in the Sedona area or on the south side of the Mogollon Rim. All right. Well, thanks.